It is an honor and a privilege to have the chance to be with you on this, this last Sunday of 2019. Like this is the time where, where for so many of us we get a chance to be able to kind of look back a little bit at the last year. Uh, but think about it, we're not really just looking back at a year. This is the last year of 2019. In just a few days it'll be 2020. We're not just starting a new year, but a new decade. And it's interesting to think back, to think back, okay, what has taken place in our lives over this last year and, and really over the last 10? And then to think what it is that God has in store for us in this new year, this, this new decade. And so what I'd like to do is to be able to take a look at a passage of scripture and to be able to look at it sort of through the lens of this past year of what has been and where we are at as well as where we are headed in the future. But before I, I go there, I have a question actually that I would love to ask you. How many of you know what this stuff is? This is, uh, this is Purell. And uh, how many of you use this on a regular basis? Show of hands, semi-regular basis, Purell. Yeah, absolutely. You find it everywhere today. Everywhere, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're going to the grocery store or to a mall, if you work out at a gym, if it's at the school that you attend. I mean, you can find this place. My guess is that some of you have it in your purse right now. You're a special germaphobe that just makes sure that you're prepared in all situations. And the beauty of this stuff is one pump and from that point now, you know that your hands are germ-free, clear of bacteria. So now when you see me after church, if you want to shake hands or high five or fist bump or whatever it is, you know that I'm in the clear. And you know as soon as I'm done shaking your hands that I'll go back and I'll use more of this just to make sure that we're all good. We use this stuff to make sure that our hands are pure. Well, today I want to look at a passage of scripture together that talks about the, the purity of our hands. It has to do with a conversation that Jesus was having with some of the Pharisees in the New Testament. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn right now in your Bibles to Mark chapter seven. Mark chapter seven, starting with verse one. If you're grabbing one of the Pew Bibles, I believe it's page 842 in there. If you're not that familiar with the Bible, that's where we're going to start off together. I'll begin reading with verse one. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Okay, let's pause there for just a minute, just to get a little bit of context. When we're reading a passage of scripture right now, I want to make sure that you know this, that Jesus is not having a conversation with the Pharisees about germs and bacteria. That is not the part of this passage. So if you're a person who doesn't wash your hands that often, and you're looking for a get out of jail free card signed off by Jesus to not have to wash your hands before you eat or after you go to the bathroom, this is not the passage of scripture for you. And by the way, that's kind of gross. So so no, this is, this is talking about ceremonial washing. You see, back at that time, um, there were all sorts of things that Pharisees did to kind of put a hedge around the life of the Jewish people to make sure that they didn't break Mosaic law. Mosaic law back at that time had all kinds of uh, different traditions that people would, would make sure that they followed. Things that could potentially make them ceremonially unclean. For instance, um, if, if a person came into contact with, with, um, a, uh, with anything that was dead, human or animal, they were considered ceremonially unclean. If, if a person had a, a skin rash or, or some type of sore that sort of had a, a discharge, you were considered ceremonially unclean. If you, if you came into contact with mildew, you were considered ceremonially unclean. There, was, there were a list of foods that a person could not eat. If you ate or came into contact with those, you would be ceremonially unclean. And if you came into contact with any person who had been in contact with any of these things, you were considered ceremonially 
unclean. That meant that you could not, uh, you could not go into the temple. It would mean that you could not worship with the people of God. And, and, and much of the life of the Jewish people was done in the marketplace. The marketplace would be full of all kinds of different people, Jews and Gentiles, people following these laws as well as not following these laws. And so therefore you had no idea who it was that you had been in contact with. So the elders created a tradition in order to put a hedge around the Jewish people of ceremonial washing that would take place. Ceremonial washing of your hands before you ate, of cups and kettles and all of these different things. And really the tradition that they created, it, when you think about it, it came from a good place. I mean, the Jewish people back at that time, they, they, they understood that they served a holy and righteous pure God. And so therefore, they were striving to live holy, righteous, pure lives before that God. That's where the tradition came from. But the Pharisees, well, they took it a step too far. Let's continue with the passage, verse six. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Okay, Jesus goes right at them. They are going to call him on the carpet for external impurity. Jesus is going to go right back at them towards internal impurity. And he calls them hypocrites. Hypocrite is a word that, um, that really moves towards the idea of play acting. It would be used a lot for different people who would be on stage. If you've ever seen a play or a musical, you know that the people that you see on that stage, well, the character they're playing is not who they really are. And Jesus was talking about this when it came to the Pharisee people, that their external lives were not matching their internal character. And he gives an example then as he continues in the passage of the way that they are living this out. Let's continue, go to verse nine. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Okay, let's talk about Corbin for just a minute. Corbin is a practice back then to a Jewish audience, they would have understood exactly what was being talked about. For us today, it takes a little bit of explanation. Back at that time, for a Jewish person, if they wanted to, and they were encouraged to by the elders of the church, if they wanted to take their finances take their assets, take their property, they could dedicate all of it to the temple. And that was called Corbin. It was a way of setting aside everything to God. Again, it was a tradition that came from a good place. I am going to take everything I have that I have been blessed with by God and I am going to give it to God by setting it aside for the temple. And this would be given to the temple someday. And, and it was kind of a, a loose practice in itself. Sometimes that money would go to the temple, but sometimes it wouldn't. And as long as the person was alive, they could continue to use their finances and their assets for whatever it is that they wanted to. But the thing that it became in this tradition was a loophole that people could use from helping their own families. So that if a family member got into a situation where they needed help financially, well, a person could say, well, I, I would love to be able to help you, but everything that I have is Corbin. Therefore, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. You see, everything that we see the Pharisees doing at this point with declaring things as Corbin, with the washing of cups and kettles, with the, the purification of hands, you realize as we read this picture, they are missing the big picture they're focused on the small and the insignificant. And if we stop to think about it, you realize they are missing the idea that they are having a conversation with the Son of God, sent into this world because of God's love for them. 
They were so focused on the small and the minute, they were missing the big picture of everything that was taking place. Back when, when I was in uh, junior high at Westminster Academy, um, my favorite sport was basketball. Like I, I loved playing basketball, fifth, sixth grade, absolutely loved it. So when I got to junior high and had the opportunity to try out for boys basketball, it was like life began for me at that time. And, uh, and so I played on the boys basketball team and, uh, and, and one of the things that was happening in the NBA at this time, this was like mid eighties to give you an idea. I'm 49, so you're not trying to do the math in your head right now. Uh, but back in the mid eighties, uh, there was a basketball player coming onto the scene in the NBA who is changing the world of basketball. He was drafted from the University of North Carolina and, and picked up by the Chicago Bulls. His name was Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan very quickly became the idol for myself and everyone else on our junior high basketball team. In his rookie year, 1984, 1985, he was taking the NBA by storm. And that year, he was chosen to play on the All-Star team, on the, in the All-Star game as a starter for his side of the All-Star game. And, uh, and also, he was invited to actually uh, participate in the slam dunk competition. And I don't, like, okay, in, in my opinion, let me just state this, I think that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. Anyone else in your mid-40s to 50s, can I get an amen from you in the room right now? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're even getting applause. That's amazing. So, sorry, LeBron, but I'm sorry, it's Michael Jordan. So, and Michael Jordan, as he was getting ready for that dunk contest, man, like, there, people were so excited to see finally Michael Jordan in the dunk competition. I remember I got my parents VCR all set up, brand new VHS tape, recorded it. My friends would get together to watch this dunk competition over and over and over again. You see a picture of him in the dunk contest. I mean, look at that height. That is unbelievable. He was changing the game of basketball. But do you know what some people actually said about him in this dunk contest? They said, what's up with his shoes? Can we go back to that picture for just a second? His shoes. You see, back then at that time, Michael Jordan was signed by Nike. And, uh, and, and Nike had no idea what they were signing on with, with Michael Jordan, no idea what they were actually about to partake in. And in his rookie year, they created the very first Air Jordans. And they created it in two different colorways. I think we have a picture of one of those shoes that we can show. And that was the shoe that he wore in the dunk contest. Now, the interesting thing, okay, also in my opinion, greatest basketball shoe who has ever, that has ever been created. That's been created in more colorways than any other basketball shoe of all time. You can still get to this day. But this particular shoe, one of the two colorways of the Air Jordan, was actually banned from the NBA from day one. And the reason why is because back at that time in the NBA, they had a rule called the 51% rule. Meaning that your shoe, number one, had to be the same colors as everyone else on your team. It had to match your team colors. But two, that the shoe actually had to be 51% matching everyone else on the court playing at that time. Back at that time, the main color that everyone else went with for their shoe was white. Therefore, Michael Jordan's Air Jordan, this colorway was banned from the NBA because it was not white enough. So, with that particular shoe, he could never wear it in a sanctioned game. However, in the NBA dunk contest, that was not a sanctioned game by the NBA. So therefore, he decided to wear those shoes. And everything that he did in that dunk contest began to rewrite the game of basketball at what was possible. There were more people, there were more Chicago Bulls fans at that time in the country, probably than any other time. And there were more people watching the dunk contest than there ever had been before that. He was, he was changing basketball altogether. He was changing athletics altogether. Some of you will be watching bowl games over the next couple days. Do you realize that some of the different college teams, there will be football teams that have a silhouette of Air Jordan on their uniform, on football uniforms, because of the impact that he has had on athletics altogether. I mean, he rewrote so much of what was possible. Small group of people going, yeah, but what about his shoes? You realize they're not the right colors. You see, they were focused on the small 
and insignificant and missing the big picture of what Michael Jordan was doing for basketball and athletics completely together. This is the same type of thing that the Pharisees are doing in this moment. Focusing on the small and insignificant rather than seeing the big picture of what God was up to, sending his son into this world to open a door for us to be in right relationship with him. Sending his son into this world to create a world based on forgiveness and grace and mercy and generosity and justice for those who can't fight for themselves. They were missing the big picture because they were focused on hand washing, cups and kettles. And the thing is, we can, we can easily sit here and give the Pharisees a very hard time about that. We could give some of the leaders of the NBA a hard time about the way they handled things with Michael Jordan's shoes, all based upon the traditions of the day. But in reality, I think that it is so unbelievable for us, so unbelievably easy for us within the church to fall into the same type of practices if we're not careful to get so focused on the traditions that we follow within the church that we might miss the big picture of what God is up to. Now let me just state one thing from the beginning. I am not anti-traditions. So when I look back to my relationship with God and where I am at in my relationship with Jesus, so much of it has to do with traditions within the church that have changed and transformed my life. I mean, I know that that for a large amount of people here at Coral Ridge today, you go to a service called the traditional service. So at Blackhawk Evangelical Free Church, where I pastor, we have a service called traditions. We are all about traditions. You know, but the thing that can happen is that all of a sudden traditions can start to play kind of a different role within our lives. But in reality, traditions are a good thing. Like, do you realize there are so many things within the church that we do because of of traditions? Like, have you ever stopped to think about when when you pray, when you when you close your eyes and bow your head to pray? You realize that's a tradition? There's nothing in scripture that says that that is the only way that we are supposed to pray. But it comes from a good place. It's from us desiring to to block out the world and to focus on God and who he is and have our mind move that direction that we would push everything and block everything else out. That's a good tradition. Some of you, you come from a, a church where you would kneel to pray. Kneeling is a good tradition. Kneeling is a tradition that's supposed to show humility and reverence before God as as we come before him. Uh, Some of you have quiet times in the morning. I know that for me, I, I love getting up in the morning and being able to open my Bible and a journal and spend time with God. Do you realize that's a tradition? That there is nothing in scripture that says that's the only way that we're supposed to spend time with God. Oh, and by the way, while we were, you're reading, you know, when you're reading your scriptures, you know that back then when, people didn't have scriptures. And so they weren't sitting down with their Bible and and their journal and a cup of coffee in the morning the way that we do. It's a tradition that we've stepped into. That's a good tradition. Some of you, you dress up for church. You know, now I grew up at Coral Ridge here. I mean, every Sunday, it was shirt and tie or a sport jacket to come to church. That is a tradition that comes from a good place. It's this picture of I want to Give my, I want to give my father the best. And so I'm, I'm going to dress in the nicest clothes that I have to show him that I desire, not just with the way I dress, but with the way I live to give him my best. Now, others of you, you go to the contemporary service and you dress down a little more for church. Do you realize that's become a tradition? You know, you, you might wear, you know, like a, a, a polo shirt or jeans with, with knee holes. And, uh, you know, that comes from a tradition. It comes from a place of people saying, I, I am, want to be a person who is authentic and just myself but before God. You see, we have all of these different traditions and they can help us in our walk with God. But, but there's a very, very interesting place that we can go with any of them like that we have to be careful with, there can be a f- switch that is, that is flipped where all of a sudden we begin to use these different traditions as a measuring stick to measure where we are at in our relationship with God. And even a, a, a worse place of using them as a measuring stick to, for me to measure where you are at in your relationship with God. Back at Westminster Academy um, years ago, I, uh, I had a, a, a second grade teacher named Mrs. Winky. 
Mrs. Winky was awesome and, uh, and just absolutely loved her. And every morning at Westminster, she would, she would start class with prayer. And, uh, and I remember this one particular day we were praying and I noticed there were some, some other people in the class who were like messing around during prayer. You know, they had their eyes open and they were joking around and doing things. And so right at the end of prayer, I felt like it was my spiritual duty to go and tell Mrs. Winky about what was taking place during prayer. And so I walked over to her. I said, Mrs. Winky, uh, I just feel like you need to know this. Um, there were some people who were messing around. They had their eyes open and they were messing around during prayer. And I just felt like that you should know this before the Lord, you know, and, 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 and Mrs. Winky, she, she sat back in her chair, just kind of with this cute little Mrs. Winky smile, and she said, interesting, and how did you know that they had their eyes open? <laughs> I said, well, 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 she said, Matt, why don't you go sit down right now? You see, a tradition of closing our eyes when we pray, absolutely fantastic. Using it as a measuring stick to measure where someone else is at in their relationship with God, all of a sudden, we are crossing a line. You see, this is what Jesus was trying to help the Pharisees understand as they were having this conversation. And so he continues. Go to verse 14 of chapter 7 as we continue. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone. And understand this, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd, he entered the house. His disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. You see, these people, they were concerned about their external impurity. Jesus is concerned about their internal impurity. Why? Because you see, Jesus knows that within our hearts, our hearts, isn't it true, are where our true motivations and intentions for everything that we do in life, that is where they lie. And so Jesus goes on to say this. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these come from inside and defile a person. Do you ever stop to think about what's the, what's the dirtiest part of your body? You ever thought about that? Like what's the dirtiest part? that you have of your body right now? Like what would you say, is it your, your feet? Like if someone sitting next to you were to take off their shoes right now and start touching you, that would be kind of gross. Or, uh, or, or what, about, what about the mouth? I, I, hear, I know there's all kinds of bacteria that, that's in the human mouth. Or, or how about your, your armpit? Like the end of the day after a South Florida summer day, that kind of stinks. Or um, uh, other unmentionables? <laughs> you see, a, According to Jesus, the dirtiest part of your body and my body, body is your, your heart. Like, it says that your, your heart is incredibly dirty. In fact, we hear this in scripture, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know, I remember when, when I came to the place of accepting Jesus as my savior here at Coral Ridge, one of the, place, one of the ways that I explained that to people was I had, um, I had given my heart to Jesus. Maybe, maybe you've said that at some point in your life. Yes, I gave my heart to Jesus. We have this picture like it's this, it's this beautiful gift that we give. We sing songs like that all the time. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. This picture of like giving our heart to Jesus like it's this beautiful gift. Well, not according to this passage. According to this passage, like our heart, it's gross. It's kind of disgusting. When we think about, look, when I think about the ways that I struggle with sin, when I think about the, the pride in my life and the arrogance that I have, 
when I think about um, the anger and defensiveness that so easily can jump up in my life, when I think of the ways that I struggle with lust, when I think of the ways that I, I deal with, uh, with interactions with people where I'm being nice on the outside, but inside I am beating you up. I think of all of those different things, I realize my heart is, is gross and so incredibly sinful. But the amazing thing is, <laughs> We serve a God who wants our heart. In fact, scripture says this. It says, I will, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You see, God's desire is to transform our hearts he desires for us to be people over time as we step into the traditions of the church that they would be things that would move us to become more like Jesus. So on this last Sunday of 2019, how's your heart? What's your heart look like right now? Not how often do you attend church or how many Bible studies you are in how much scripture you've memorized, how early you get up to have your quiet times, how many places you're serving at this church and in the community. What does your heart look like? Like over the last year, over the last decade, have you been a person who has begun to look more like Jesus? Like, how are you doing at forgiving people? Have you become a person who is more self-controlled? Are you more gracious and merciful? Have you become a person over the last year who is more joyful? Because you see, like, have you become a person who's more generous with people you come in contact with? Have you become a person who, who cares more than you used to about the needs of those who can't fight for themselves and desire to seek justice for those people? You see, because the, the whole idea of what God desires to continue to do in our lives is to transform our hearts to look more like Jesus. And so over the last year, when you look at the last year in the last decade, are you, have you become a person who looks more like Jesus or have you just become more churchy? Because God's desire would be to come in and to transform our hearts, making us people who every day reflect more the image of God by the way that we understand who he is. That these traditions that we step into that are in good places ultimately would be the things that are changing our heart, making us more like Jesus, rather than just making us people who are more committed to the church. And so as you look at this coming year, 20, 2020, as we begin a new year and a new decade, what's the work that you desire to see God do in your life? You know, that would be a fantastic conversation to have with a friend, with a Bible study, with a small group, with your family, to be able to talk about where's your heart? Where are the places that God needs to do work in you? May we be people who use the traditions within the church to allow God not just to transform our external actions, but our internal character, that we would be a community of people who reflect more and more the true character of Jesus.